Hola, buenos días. Eh, bueno, vamos a dar comienzo a la conferencia, la charla, al espacio de medicina de precisión en enfermedad renal. Eh, en esta ocasión la tenemos a la doctora Añez Pogo, que va a hablar de reclasificación de la nefritis lúpica. Para que conozcan algo sobre la doctora Pogo, que es mundialmente conocida, es la titular de la Cátedra de Patología del John Shapiro, es profesora del Departamento de Patología, Microbiología, Inmunología y profesora en Medicina y Pediatría. Además, la doctora es directora del Laboratorio de Patología Renal en la Universidad de Vanderbilt. Es muy importante que esté la doctora con nosotros porque ella formó parte de un encuentro que se hizo en The Netherlands en mayo del 2016 eh, con la, eh, de, formó parte de un grupo de 18, de 18 profesionales convocado por la Sociedad Internacional de Nefrología y la Sociedad Americana de Patología para indagar sobre algunas cuestiones de la nefritis lúpica que no estaban muy claras algunas redefiniciones, algunos conceptos que estaban en obsoleto siempre tendiendo a esto de perfeccionar la microscopía para poder llegar a un diagnóstico con mayor certeza, más preciso y elegir de ese modo una medicación más adecuada y conocer un poco el pronóstico del paciente. Buen día a todos, de verdad que es un privilegio y un placer que Agnes esté aquí con nosotros, realmente eh, destacable, no me voy a poner a repasar su currículum, ¿no? pero yo quiero resaltar sobre todo su pasión por enseñar, su capacidad de innovar, su capacidad de siempre estar cuestionando los dogmas y, y creando nuevos conceptos. Así que, y el corolario de esto es que ella es una de tres candidatas para ser la, el próximo presidente de la ISN. Así que es un verdadero pri, privilegio tenerla aquí. Gracias, Agnes. No, no, I said you're one of three candidates. I need to learn Spanish, very honestly. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be with you this morning, too. And it is my honor to be part of this wonderful meeting. Today we are going to talk about lupus nephritis, a very common problem in your country. So let us start by thinking about a patient. It's always useful to put that context in place. So this was a 27-year-old man. We have to remember that although lupus classically is the disease of young, middle-aged females, men are not completely protected. He had a previous biopsy in 2009 that showed membranous lupus nephritis, ISN RPS class 5, and diffuse lupus nephritis, ISN RPS class 4. He had one glomerulus with collapse then. He had remission in response to aggressive immunotherapy. And now, eight years later, he has marked nephrotic syndrome and increased serum creatinine. So do you know clinically what has happened? Does lupus stay the same? Does it change? Can we predict how it will change? With therapy, without therapy? I mean, we need a biopsy. So let's discuss some of the things that we can know about lupus. It is complicated. Lupus nephritis is a simple term, but it is not just one entity. Up to 60% of patients with SLE develop lupus nephritis. And we use this term specifically only to describe immune complex disease caused by lupus not other things that can happen with SLE patients. It is associated with considerable morbidity and poor survival, particularly if a lupus patient has end-stage kidney disease, they do very poorly. The diagnosis, pathogenesis, and treatment of lupus nephritis are intricately linked. The histopathologic findings of lupus nephritis vary considerably. We need to classify lupus nephritis. It is essential for treatment decisions. So here we can see three biopsies in three different patients with lupus nephritis, and they look very differently, and you would treat them differently. Here is one that only has some mesangial increase. This one has areas where it looked like a bomb went off. A 
lot of cellularity and destruction. And here, maybe you see the very thick capillary wall of the silver stain with a spike reaction reacting to the membranous deposits. All three, lupus and nephritis, very, very different. So very importantly, although Slick has suggested that patients can be diagnosed by SLE based on lupus nephritis findings in the biopsy, we do not make the diagnosis of SLE by the renal biopsy. We don't have any criteria for making a diagnosis of SLE by the renal biopsy. Rather, renal biopsy defines the type of renal lesion in a patient with SLE. So the nephrologist and rheumatologist need to talk together a little bit more. The rheumatologist think we make the diagnosis of SLE from the biopsy. They are a little bit crazy, but we need to teach them. So when you do a biopsy to answer questions in patients with SLE and kidney disease, this is what I should tell you. Is lupus nephritis present? That means immune complex in the glomeruli. If it is present, what class, what category? Is it active or chronic? Are there other lesions, vascular lesions, like a thrombotic microangiopathy or vasculitis? Are there tubular deposits? Is there photocytopathy? By that we mean extensive foot process effacement or collapsing lesions that probably are not directly related to the immune deposits. Could the patient have something that is not lupus? It happens. We have lupus patients who get diabetes. We have lupus patients who get cholesterol emboli. We have lupus patients who get tubular toxicity from aminoglycosides. We need to remember they are not protected from other disease. Or do they have a very complicated biopsy, lupus and non-lupus disease? So the wide spectrum of lesions, the wide spectrum of implications for treatment means that we need to classify. And maybe you know that we pathologists, we love to look very detailed at everything and split and split and split and split and split, and split to classify. And then sometimes we have to take a deep breath, take a step back, and then lump, and then split, and then lump until we get something that approaches precision medicine from a group of patients that can be meaningfully applied to one patient. So here is the abbreviated current ISN RPS classification of lupus glomerulonephritis. So it doesn't include things outside the glomerulus. We gave up. I was part of this working group. So for complicated historical reasons, <coughs> mesangial deposits and their consequences are divided into class 1 and 2. <coughs> Those of you who are senior, like myself, remember that WHO class one, lupus nephritis, was the absence of any deposits. It is really crazy. I think that those senior people way back then must have had some very nice wine before they decided on this. But the, the reason was that they had young women with SLE who had hematuria. They did biopsies. They found no deposits, no abnormality, and they said, we will be so very, very smart, we will call it class one lupus to give rise for the subtle thing we are not detecting. But can you imagine, those of you who deal with pathology and disease, if I have a breast lump and I have a biopsy, and my wonderful pathology colleague says, Agnes, I have wonderful news for you. You have class one breast cancer. No breast cancer at all. <laughs> it makes no sense. So we try to fix this in the ISN RPS classification. But can you imagine how crazy it would be if we just eliminated it? And then I have to explain to you, oh, we take that one class, so all the numbers are shifted. So now, class four, it's not so bad. You used to call it five. We would all be doing crazy math in our head. So without any evidence that there is any difference at all, just because of the forefathers, they were all men, who made class one lupus nephritis without deposits, we split it to maintain the number. It's a long explanation, but there is some logic to it. So minimal mesangial lupus means deposits by IF, but you see no reaction 
by light microscopy. Class two, you see deposits, mostly in the mesangium, with some proliferation in the mesangium. Class three, focal lupus nephritis, means that less than half of the glomeruli show a bad lesion. It can be an active lesion of endocapillary hypercellularity or necrosis or a cellular crescent, or it can be a chronic lesion of segmental scarring or a fibrous crescent adhesion or a mix. Diffuse lupus nephritis means that more than half the glomeruli show bad lesions. And because of some data, we said, well, does it matter if these lesions are segmental? Only part of the glomerulus or global? I will talk more about that. Membranous lupus nephritis are subepithelial deposits, mostly. We decided this should be most of the glomeruli showing evidence of capillary loop deposits. And then advanced stage lupus, I'm very glad we use this very rarely when we cannot classify it because it's over 90% scarred. So this is the logic of simplifying the previous WHO and trying to improve it. So this is mesangial lupus nephritis. You can see in my schema here, we have purple deposits in the mesangial. And if we look in real life, we can see that the mesangial areas have a little bit increased cells. And we can see by immunofluorescence a mesangial pattern of staining. The immunofluorescence typically has full house. If you play card games like poker, you know that full house is three of a kind, all immunoglobulins, G, A, M, and two of a kind, classic and alternate pathways of complement. Uh, we have C1Q and C3. And then if we come to the EM, let me orient you. We have glomerular basement membrane, we have capillary lumen, we have urinary space, we have foot processes that are pretty intact because they are not bothered by these mesangial deposits sitting underneath the basement membrane as the basement membrane goes over the mesangial area. Then let's go to the next simple one, membranous lupus nephritis. Subepithelial deposits, full house pattern. Sometimes they have been there long enough, they irritate the podocytes, they make a spike reaction to build around them, and we can see them by light microscopy. But sometimes we cannot see the spike reaction. It is very, very early. So here is the schema. And then here we can see in real life on a silver stain, membranous glomerulonephritis. The GBM is very prominent, and we can see the spikes. The pink in between are the actual deposits. The black is the reaction to the deposits. And by immunofluorescence, you can see the capillary loop staining. I'm showing you here a very high power, so you can see distinctly it is granular. It is like a green necklace. Each of these is the deposits. Each of these little green beads is the subepithelial deposit. And by EM, on low power, we can see the mesangial area, we can see the glomerular basement membrane over the mesangium, the capillary wall, and even on this low power, we can see these dark deposits. Deposits are extracellular, non-membrane bound densities, and these are subepithelial. Then we have the bad lupus, class three and four. These often present more dramatically with a mixed nephritic, nephrotic proteinuria, and the driving force typically are subendothelial deposits, so they are very bad. So I hope that you will play a little game with me so you will remember this. All of my colleagues, my students that I have taught have played this game. You get to say with me, subendothelial deposits are bad. Now why do I want you to say this? Because then you will remember this so very well, because it's a silly game. So will you say with me? Subendothelial deposits are bad. Oh, but you did not say anything. You were laughing and smiling, but you did not say it. So we have to do it again. I really want you all to feel how good it feels to say this out loud. So we'll do it one more time. Subendothelial deposits are bad. They are very bad. So 
This now is a silly game, but you will remember this experience. They are bad because they drive the lesions. The cellular crescents, the necrosis, the endocapillary proliferation, and these are the ones that heal to make the fibrous fibrocellular crescents and most of the time give rise to the scarring. And it has a bad prognosis. So it's very easy now to understand renal pathology. So here is a schema of the subendothelial deposits and you can see they cause a cell reaction. We get a new basement membrane formed on the inside. We have endocapillary hypercellularity with inflammatory cells and the endogenous cells proliferating. And in real life, look at how bad the glomerulus looks. This is from an atlas that I did many, many years ago and recently updated. It's free. I never got a penny from it. I have no conflict of interest. It's for your education at ajkd.org. So here you can see this part of the glomerulus is all full. Do you remember yesterday I showed you the face of collapsing glomerulopathy? Adafa, do you want to show them the face? You do this very well. Can you do yep. Oh, you have to turn your face. They can't see you. <laughs> yeah, please, help. Exactly. Like that. So now, Adafa, I'm sorry, you're not finished helping me. Can you turn around? Now we're going to do endocapillary hypercellularity. <laughs> okay? So these are opposite responses. We can say this is a response to the deposits. And here we can see that those deposits are very irritating and the cells can make a new basement membrane. So we can see here the double contour with the reaction to those bad deposits. Sometimes we can see necrosis and the beginnings of a crescent with this endocapillary hypercellularity. And by immunofluorescence, we can see the chunky deposits. They look like little green sausages along the capillary wall. These are the subendothelial deposits. They're very smooth underneath the basement membrane and they're mesangial deposits too. And then we can see here, we can see the glomerular basement membrane, the urinary space, this is Bobin's capsule, the cells filling up the bad endocapillary hypercellularity, and here are subendothelial deposits. Here we can see the overall schema of the mesangial lupus classes that I've shown you, simplified, the mesangial deposits, they cause a reaction in the mesangium. It's very logical. The bad lupus, class 3 or 4, those subendothelial deposits, are they good or bad? Bad. See, you have very good short-term memory. These deposits, the subendothelial deposits, causes proliferation necrosis. And the subepithelial deposits, which cells do they bother? The podocytes, we get nephrotic proteinuria and a spike reaction that we can see. So let us look more at the depth of the subendothelial deposits. So here you can see a close-up of the original glomerular basement membrane. We have some effaced foot processes, a couple that are just blunted. And here is the deposit. It is underneath the original basement membrane. And here is a cell that has reacted to it, a monocyte macrophage. And it's such a bad deposit, it causes the cell to react and new basement membrane formed. So um, in the textbook I did with Mike Kashkirian, I got to make color images of the EM. I was running up and down the hallway in my department with a handful of Sharpie color pens. And my chairman says, Agnes, what are you doing? I was going very fast. I had a deadline. And I have a handful of eight different color Sharpie pens. And I said, Sam, I'm coloring. And he said, oh, I'm glad that my senior renal pathologist is doing really useful things. Okay. <laughs> so this is what we did. Because it's very hard to put arrows on everything on an EM. So now you can see the cell. This is the infiltrating cell. You can see the deposit is gray, the podocyte is purple, and the basement membrane is blue, the matrix material, and here are the endothelial cells. So you can understand each element here. So these different patterns of injury correlate with the clinical presentation. The mesangial cells, when they are injured, like in very mild IgA nephropathy, 
We have asymptomatic proteinuria, maybe just microscopic hematuria. The endocapillary injury is bad. Yes, we get hematuria, but also the capillary loops are not open. We get loss of GFR. We have proteinuria. We have inflammatory lesions. We may even break the capillary wall and cause a crescent. And the podocyte injury causes nephrotic range proteinuria and uh, injury to the podocytes. So this is very simple, but lupus doesn't stay the same at the presentation. This complicated uh, graph from Surya Session and Charles Jeanette shows the presentation of different patients. So you can see that, excuse me, you can see that most of the time the patients present there. We have very few patients with class one that are biopsied. Patients who have normal creatinine, asymptomatic hematuria, you don't biopsy them often. So you can see that mostly this is true, but occasionally patients don't obey the rules. Some patients with just mesangial deposits have nephrotic syndrome. Most of them are in this range. So you can see that there are general tendencies. So the point of this table is to show you that even if you look at the clinical presentation of nephrotic syndrome, you cannot be sure that it's just membranous. There could be other things going on. So you need a biopsy. Here is the simplest way we can think about lupus, like we have just discussed, mesangial or proliferative or membranous. And then maybe, since we pathologists like to split, maybe we could say, how bad is it? Is it present in more than half the glomerular, less than half? Is it active or chronic? Is it segmental or global? This is the basis of splitting. So after we met many years ago and talked and discussed and tried to improve the WHO classification, maybe some of you remember we had A, B, C, D, you know, member this, but it was a difficult communication type. This is what we ended up with. You're not supposed to be able to read it. So many words, so much complications after many experts worked for a long time. So we did the best we could, but challenges remain with this classification. There's a lack of precise differentiation of types of cells in hypercellular lesions. And what really is hypercellular? Is there an evidence? Should it be three cells in a mesial area or four? In IgA nephropathy, we use evidence for the cutoff. How helpful is it to say A plus C? When was the last time you got a biopsy that only said A or only said C? I think almost all of them say A plus C. And we did not make an activity and chronicity index because we didn't have evidence for this. Can we be more granular, more detailed in describing the lesions? What about inter-observer variability? There are studies to show that ISN RPS improved things from WHO, but is it good enough? So, uh, we had a meeting led by Ingeborg Vajima in Leiden, Amsterdam, in Leiden, the Netherlands, and myself, and we came up with a recommendation, level one based on experience and opinion and logic, and level two we are starting on to collect unbiased data to determine the significance of varying lesions using the IgA nephropathy MES plus C as a guideline. So this is what I will spend the rest of our time sharing with you. So what about inter-observer variability? This is a really fun picture to look at. So look at this. It's so tricky, isn't it? Are there four? Are there three? They are both correct. It depends upon your point of view. So we started out with a survey that we sent out to members of the Renal Pathology Society to get some information. We had pictures of glomeruli and we said, what do you think? It, it doesn't matter, you're not supposed to see this. These are just all of the things we asked. A picture of one glomerulus, tell us what you think. We had many members. We had 34 people who cared about lupus who participated, so it's not a scientific complete sample, but it represented 12 countries. And we found that we had disagreement on many lesions. So you can see that the Kappa scores were not good for any of that. 
but these were random people who decided to support. And even something simple, is the lesion segmental or global, we have a lot of variability. So here, let me explain to you. These are the individual glomeruli we looked at. Here is a glomerulus that almost everybody agrees. One person thought that this was global, global is green, and everybody else said it's segmental. We would say probably this person doesn't have a sound uh, bias. And then we say here we have some glomeruli. We have two glomeruli where there was 100% agreement. And all of the other glomeruli, we had disagreements. So why do we disagree? Sometimes we observe different things. We are not all equally focused. I'm sure you have had patients where you got an additional piece of history or noticed something unusual that somebody else just didn't observe. Sometimes we use different definitions. I say it's hypercellular, you say no, but if my definition is four cells in the zangium and yours is three, we will disagree. I don't think that we should have this as the primary thing, but sometimes we don't know what we're doing. This happens too. Sometimes we make opinions about things we don't know anything about. I don't want to get too political, but there's a certain president in a country I'm traveling to later today who doesn't know what he's doing. So why do we disagree? It depends upon what we're looking at, our perspective, the definitions we do, what we're doing. So let's take some examples. Look at this glomerulus. Is the lesion segmental or global? Now first we have to define what is segmental. The Chicago group of Rush, of Ed Lewis and Melvin Schwartz said segmental is anything less than 100%. All other people, for lupus, say segmental is less than 50%. In FSGS, we say anything less than 100% is segmental. So what is it? Well, let me help you a little bit. So here are the definitions. So now I have mapped the glomerulus, the lesions that we can all agree if we use artificial intelligence or computer, have hypercellularity. Now, is that less than half or more than half? It's maybe exactly half, right? It's very difficult to have reproducibility. And lesions are on a continuum, so there will be lesions that are difficult. So what about segmental versus global? Does it matter? The original data from the Rush Chicago group had a set of patients that they described as severe segmental lupus nephritis. So it involved most of the glomeruli. Based on their definition from very old WHO, I won't go into what they called it, but the actual lesions were segmental necrosis and crescents. They called it severe class three. That, that is not the, what we would call it now, but very segmental necrotizing lesions. So we included this in the ISN RPS classification and many follow-up studies were done to look at does it matter for the outcome, the risk ratio for um, heart progression and end-stage renal disease. And you can see that most of the studies cross the interval. One study found that it mattered there was increased risk, several found not. There's no agreement. So we decided maybe there is no good basis, even though they had a unique cohort of patients Maybe there is no evidence basis for right now. So the definitions matter. We know in art, the very nice, ironic thing to see in the pine peak, and this is not a crescent. We have to have a definition. It's a little bit of cells, but not a crescent. So we had a lot of fun three years ago in Leiden. Our aim was to improve problematic definitions that form the basis of the lupus nephritis classification and thereby increase inter-observer agreement between nephropathologists worldwide who apply these definitions to classify lupus nephritis. And our paper of the proceedings, our opinions, our plan, our recommended changes has been published in KI. So we wanted to have an evidence-based approach. Our first step was to look at the existing definitions and see by using logic and experience and data 
can we improve it? And definitions are important because they form the essential element on which the classification is based. So, what we did in Leiden and since working on our manuscript was to adjust definitions for inconsistencies, vagueness, and omissions. We had minor changes to some thresholds if evidence to do so already exists. We clarified details and we provided useful examples in our paper to illustrate difficult lesions. And we felt very comfortable making these recommendations for changes, but so many things we didn't have evidence. So level two, this is the next level that is in process to improve lupus nephritis classification, get more to precision medicine, is an evidence-based multi-center study scoring separate parameters and relate to outcome. Now, one of the logistical problems is that we don't want to score and give probabilistic analysis of outcome for untreated lupus nephritis. We know from the studies from Pollock and um, 50 years ago that patients with bad lupus who are not treated die. Not kidney death, they die. So we're not looking for natural history of untreated lupus nephritis. And treatments are changing so much. If you are looking at a cohort from 15 years ago, and you are looking at a cohort now, it's complicated. So we are still trying to find the best cohort to study that is relevant. The results from this will be used to guide possible modifications of the existing classifications system. So let me tell you the problem areas that we want to solve. Conundrums of the mesangium and lupus nephritis. How much hypercellularity in how many glomeruli matters in lupus nephritis? Is it like IgA nephropathy? Or maybe the hypercellularity has a different impact? How can we combine this with matrix expansion? Is there a cutoff? What about if we have cells other than mesangial cells? Is it endocapillary hypercellularity with some inflammatory cells also? So here we have a hypercellular area. Is this different than this kind of area in terms of response or impact? Or maybe in lupus, just mesangial hypercellularity doesn't have a bad impact. In IgA nephropathy, it does. So level one, we decided before we have additional evidence, at least we are going to have a consistent definition of hypercellularity. We said hypercellularity now is defined as four cells per mesangial area, congruent with IgA nephropathy and all other studies that normal is three. In level two, we have to determine cutoff to distinguish class one versus two. Maybe there is no difference other than the historical reason. We have to see how many glomeruli, how much cyprocellularity, and the roles of inflammatory cells in the mesangial. If they are just mesangial cells or inflammatory cells, does it matter? So for instance, here from Dr. Franco Ferrario, we have CD68 staining in that same case I showed you. Aren't you surprised how many macrophages stained for CD68 are present here? Does it matter if they are macrophages or mesangial cells? in terms of response to therapy. We hope to find out. What about considerations of endocapillary lesions? We have always before used the term endocapillary proliferation, but now we know that the type and number of cells involved are unclear. The amount of lumen reduction necessary to say it's endocapillary proliferation is unclear. We don't know how much truly is proliferation. What is the role of the endothelial cells? So if we look a little bit further, we decided already on a cell biological logical level, we will replace the term endocapillary proliferation with endocapillary hypercellularity. Because many of these cells have not proliferated, they are influx of circulating inflammatory cells. So hypercellularity is a descriptor. Proliferation implies a process of cell division. And we do not have evidence to know which is more important. Our level two tasks are to determine cutoff for a number of inflammatory cells. How much capillary lumen narrowing 
before we say endocapillary hypercellularity? One cell? Two? A little bit? A lot? How do we define this? And the role of endothelial swelling. We have to then consider the conundrums of extra capillary lesions, the crescents. What is the cutoff between a fibrous and a cellular crescent? We think a crescent needs to be more than one parietal epithelial cell, right? How big does it have to be before we say it's a crescent? How do we score a glomerulus if it has a cellular and a fibrous crescent? Some details that we need to think about. So, the composition of these crescents can be just epithelial cells. These are mostly parietal cells. And there also is an influx of monocytes and macrophages. So we change the threshold from 25% of the circumference to make it congruent with IgA nephropathy. Only 10% of the circumference needs to be involved before we call it a crescent. What about segmental versus global lesions? I showed you already the data. Everybody studied this because we included it in the classification based on the experience of the Chicago group, but the results are very varied. There is a huge amount of inter-observer variation. So we don't know how to combine the endocapillary lesions or extracapillary lesions to say if it's a segmental or global lesion. We had originally from the Chicago group, they emphasized that it was severe and that it was segmental but they didn't emphasize that it looked vasculitic. Now we understand that some of these patients have additional ANCO. They have a vasculitic type injury. So we think at this point, we don't have evidence to divide segmental or global lesions. But clearly, we need to describe these patients. And we need to say that we have an active necrotizing lesion here but how to classify it, whether we lump it with the endocapillary hypercellularity, we need to figure that out. So let's think about a couple of patients now that we have looked at some of these problems. This patient was a woman with SLE. She had a biopsy with class two mesangial proliferative lupus two years before. She had recurrent lupus flares with arthralgias chronic anemia. She was treated with hydroxychloroquine, prednisone, plaquenil, and belimumab. And she need to have a follow-up that showed increased serum creatinine. I mean, her serum creatinine was stable, but her proteinuria increased from minimal to three plus with a protein creatinine ratio that was not so high, but it was a big increase. Her C3 was slightly low. Her C4 was within normal limits, but low normal. Her serum albumin is slightly low. So she was biopsied. Would you biopsy her? Yes. Yeah. Even though her serum creatinine is normal, her clinical presentation has changed. So what is your clinical differential? She had class two lupus two years ago. She has 1.28 grams of protein now. <laughs> How many think she just has membranous lupus now, early membranous lupus? Nobody thinks she has that? How about diffuse lupus nephritis, class 4? She could have that even with a normal creatinine. Creatinine is insensitive. It's a late marker of destruction of kidney. How about focal lupus nephritis? A few think... Well, you can't think she both has diffuse and focal. Those are mutually exclusive, but she could, right? So we're talking about what you have. What about TMA and membranous? So this is tricky. Many lupus patients have TMA in the biopsy, but don't show peripheral blood changes. She, TMA, it, it could be present. What about diffuse lupus and membranous lupus? I'm sorry, this is a type of, this should be ISN RPS class 5, so class 4 and class 5. Well, this, we don't know. These are very different possibilities, and you would treat them a little bit differently, wouldn't you? So let's look at her biopsy. So from this biopsy, 
from this appearance, does she still have only class two? No, you have very good eyes because you are seeing this broad-based adhesion and scarring. And what about this area? Is it normal or abnormal? Really abnormal. So we have a necrotizing lesion, endocapillary hypercellularity. Here we have, maybe this is a fibrocellular crescent. Here is another glomerulus. Is it normal or abnormal? It's abnormal too. So here we have again these little triangular areas here. It looks like maybe it was an active crescent with a little fibrocellular scar. Endocapillary hypercellularity. And maybe you are seeing, what about the capillary wall? Does it look thin and delicate? Or does it look a little bit easy to see? Easy to see. So already I'm thinking, hmm. Could there be something in the capillary wall? Could there be membranes too? And then here, she has more scars. So she has segmental scars, endocapillary hypercellularity here. So we have to look at all of the glomeruli to see, is it class three or four? And then we have to look at the immunofluorescence and say, does she have class five? We have to look at the tubules, the vessels. So here are the IF and EM. Here is the IF. So I am going to teach you the advanced art of looking at IF. Are you ready? So step one, is it green or not? It's green. See, you already passed the step one. Very easy. Step two, is it green in the mesangium? That means it looks like a little pruned bush. Or the capillaries, that means it looks like somebody painted a glomerulus. Or both. Both. You are very, very good. Now we come to the advanced level. Is the capillary loop staining linear or granular? Granular. So you can take care of my biopsies when I'm at home. This is wonderful. So when we look at this granular pattern, we have to decide. It likely could be membranous lupus nephritis, but here we need the EM because sometimes small, delicate subendothelial deposits can be regularly spaced, right? She has a lot of endocapillary hypercellularity. But if we have subepithelial deposits by IF, evidence by LM, it needs to be in most of the glomeruli and most of the loops by current definition to say it's membranous lupus nephritis. So let's look at the EM. So I've shown you just a close-up of one loop. So here we have the peripheral capillary loop, the podocytes, a little bit of increase of an endothelial cell. Do you see any deposits? Yes. So what are those peripheral granular deposits in the IF? Are they membranous type deposits? Yes. These are membranous type deposits. And I didn't show you great pictures here, but in other areas, we had some subendothelial, we have some sandal deposits, we have reticular aggregates that I'm showing you close up here. So the reticular aggregates just make me happy. They are not absolutely necessary for diagnosis of lupus. They are in endothelial cells mostly, and they are a sign of high interferon. Not pathognomonic for lupus. We see them commonly in three conditions. Patients with SLE, whether or not they have lupus nephritis. Patients with HIV infection, whether or not they have the nephropathy. And remember, patients who receive exogenous interferon therapy. This is a red flag saying high levels of interferon. So now, what is your diagnosis? How many think she just has membranous lupus nephritis? Good. What about membranous lupus nephritis and class three, focal? Okay, that could be, I didn't show you how many glomeruli were involved, so if I tell you more than half the glomeruli had the bad lesions, you will say, oh, I know advanced math, it's not class three. How about membranous lupus nephritis plus class four lupus nephritis? This fits very well with what I've shown you. How about membranous lupus nephritis and those segmental scars are idiopathic FSGS? Oh, you are so good. You remember everything we talked about FSGS. 
And obviously, we don't have just diffuse lupus nephritis. We have many subepithelial deposits. So her diagnosis was membranous lupus nephritis class 5 and diffuse lupus nephritis, active plus chronic, ISN RPS class 4. And I didn't show you the pictures. She also had focal tubular basement membrane deposits. So this is a classic case of segmental scar with activity related to the bad subendothelial deposits. So let's look at another patient, just to give you a perspective on these segmental scarring lesions. A 27-year-old woman with lupus, sickle cell anemia. She had ITP history. She had been treated with rituximab, prednisone. Her platelets were normal now. Her serum creatinine baseline was 0.6. Her last pregnancy, she had preeclampsia. Of course, we don't know if it's preeclampsia or worsening of lupus. She had increased hypertension and progenerian pregnancy. Just two months ago, she presented with a creatinine from 0.6 to 1.65. Serum albumin 3.4, urine protein creatinine ratio 3.4, three red cells per high power field on UA, standard serology for virus negative, and of course a renal biopsy was done. We need a renal biopsy. And she had just started on cell septum. <coughs> so let's look here first on the IF and the EM. So you remember your course in IF? It's green. It's green in the glomerulus. It's green maybe in the mesangium and the capillary wall. It's not projecting so well. Maybe you can see little dots along the capillary wall. And when we go to the EM, we can see small sub-epithelial deposits and a reticular aggregate. So what about the light microscopy? So she had, out of her 20 glomeruli, she had three or four glomeruli that looked like this. So first of all, I didn't include very high power pictures. She has <laughs> tiny little spikes and pinpoint hole appearance of her membranous nephropathy in the loops. You can see they are prominent. What do you think about this lesion? It's a segmental lesion. Is it segmental endocapillary hypercellularity? Oh, I think it's mostly matrix. The silver stain stains matrix, and we have a lot of black here, so to me this is mostly black. And I do not see the broad-based adhesion here. I think we don't have really increased cells in this area. This is a segmental sclerosing lesion, and I don't have evidence anywhere of endocapillary hypercellularity or fibrous crescents. So, what is the diagnosis? Membranous lupus nephritis? Well, she has that, but something else too. Membranous lupus nephritis plus sickle cell nephropathy? That, that could cause us to have segmental scarring, but it causes marked glomerulomegaly, and we didn't see any sickle cells in the biopsy. But before the biopsy, we could think about this. What about membranous lupus nephritis and ISN RPS class 3 A plus C? Well, it can't be that because we had no active lesions. We had no endocapillary hypercellularity or necrosis or cellular crescents. How about membranous lupus nephritis ISN RPS class 5 plus chronic class 3. Yeah, so by current ISN RPS definitions, if you follow the rules completely, you would say this is chronic class 3. Or segmental sclerosis seconded or preeclampsia. Well, it doesn't quite fit, does it? The current ISN RPS certainly allows me to say this is membranous lupus nephritis. How do we interpret that segmental sclerosis of usual type? So this is tricky. By definition, a segmental sclerosing lesion should lead to diagnosis of class 3C or class 4C, right? But 
Are all segmental sclerosing lesions the same? And remember, idiopathic primary membranous nephropathy also shows segmental sclerosis lesions. So we want to look at this and see if we can determine the difference of these lesions. If I diagnose class three, chronic, with these focal, very uh, occasional segmental sclerosing lesions. I think nephrologists will think there's a class three, there's an active component, I should give more immunosuppression, even though I say chronic. And I think the pathogenesis of this patient's segmental sclerosis is not from bad subendothelial deposits. I didn't have any. <coughs> or from bad crescentic lesions. I didn't have any signs of that morphologically. So can I distinguish this type of segmental scar from the scarring that is healing of active lesions? We're hoping to do this. So let's look at what happened with the group of Ingeborg Bajima when they looked at clinical and histopathological characteristics associated with renal outcomes in lupus nephritis. They had 105 cases of lupus nephritis. They had almost 10 years of follow-up. They found that renal flare was predicted by fibrinoid necrosis and non-white race. They found that end-stage renal disease was predicted by fibrinoid necrosis, fibrous crescents, IFTA more than 25%, and non-white race. So they concluded from their 105 patients, in the assessment of the risk of progressive renal dysfunction, the lupus nephritis classification should include an index of evidence-based predictors in conjunction with clinical findings. So these are the, some of the goals we hope to build past this 105 patients to a broader group of patients looking at that. What about other things in lupus? Does it matter? We have non-immune complex lesions. I alluded to early, podocytopathies, vascular lesions, TBM deposits. We have to have a biopsy for specific diagnosis. Here we have a vessel that just is scarred with intimal fibrosis. If we only have uncomplicated vascular deposits, as we can see by IF, there is no impact on prognosis. But if you have thrombotic microangiopathy, meaning fibrin thrombi in the vessel, or necrotizing lesions, lupus vasculopathy, or the very rare lesions of lupus vasculitis with inflammation and necrosis, this is very bad. And we don't have much studies of it. The TMA occurs in any class of lupus nephritis, with or without NF-phospholipid, or anti-cardiolipin antibodies. About 25 to 50% of lupus patients have antiphospholipid antibody. Not all of these have TMA. In the kidney, TMA in large arteries with thrombosis and cortical necrosis is a very bad prognostic sign and happens in some of our APL patients. So what about if we put all of this together and other than A plus C, we tell you something more detailed about activity and chronicity. Clearly, A, C, or A plus C are not detailed enough. So we gave up with the ISN RPS working group that I was part of to improve or refine the NIH activity chronicity index because we didn't have data. We couldn't agree. But we think now that this should be reported. We should give some indication of the elements of activity, more granular other than to say activity or chronicity. So here are the original activity and chronicity indices of hypercellularity, endocapillary, leukocytes, subendothelial, hyaline deposits, remember they are bad, fibrinoid necrosis, cellular crescents, interstitial inflammation, and the markers of chronicity you can see. So for now, we think this is better than A or C or A plus C, but we need to have evidence for this. So the grading of it is very different. We won't spend time on this slide. There are many different ways 
people have looked at this. So all refinement of this will evade level two evidence. But for now, we say something more granular is good. One of the reasons we couldn't agree on this is that that detailed NIH scoring is very poorly reproducible. My very good friend Mel Schwartz, who now has retired, pathologist at Chicago, actually published a paper proving that he didn't agree with himself. Amazing. So he scored biopsies with NIH index. He put them aside. Six months later, he took them out, blinded, not knowing <coughs> which one he had scored which level, and scored them again, and he did not agree with himself. So we need something that is more reproducible in our lab now. <coughs> We have not given a detailed specific number, but we have said mild, moderate, and severe <coughs> activity or chronicity and told you the number of glomeruli with each lesion. So now we know a lot, right, about problems and knowledge. Let's go back to our first patient. Just to remind you, he had a previous biopsy of membranous lupus and diffuse lupus with a glomerulus with collapse. He went in remission with aggressive <coughs> immunotherapy. Now he has marked nephrotic syndrome and increased creatinine. So this is what he showed. So already you can look at the biopsy, you can look at what I wrote. He shows a collapsing lesion and it was present in many of his glomeruli. Looking together, we could see he still had membranous lupus nephritis. He now had focal lupus nephritis, A plus C. He had mild activity and mild chronicity. And he had a collapsing glomerulopathy. Compared to the previous biopsy, one of the very important things, we had more collapse and less activity of the endocapillary hypercellular lesion. And this severe injury, this severe podocyte injury is not captured by the current classification. So we will be working very hard for the next uh, several years. We're going to classify the non-glomerular lesions. We're going to refine the activity and chronicity description. We are going to look with further dissection of varied pathogenesis and importance of varied glomerular lesions. I gave you an example of the different types of sclerosing lesions, the usual type versus healed crescent. So my ZebraNAF is very relevant for lupus, as it is for segmental sclerosis, FSGS we discussed yesterday. We need to figure out exactly what all the parts are that make up the beast of lupus nephritis. So I want to lastly thank the Leiden Working Group. Ingeborg Bajima was the engine and the person who initiated all of this. And this is the group of people who met in Leiden and who continue to work on this, now with input from excellent, experienced nephrologists and rheumatology, to try to do a better job in being able to classify and give you important information about lupus biopsies. Thank you very much for your attention.